don't overcomplicate things. Um, at the end of the day, like like I said before, like you work, you go to work, um, you earn the money, respect your money by looking after it. Hi, my name is Kate Brown and I'm very excited to be on Property Investry. Fantastic. Well, Kate, thank you so much for coming on to Property Investry. I'm very, very excited to have you on today. Well, I guess maybe firstly, let's just start off with what you do, your title and since you've done so much, feel free to brag about it. <laughs> Is that a humble brag? <laughs> humble brag. Um, yeah. yeah um, well, yeah, As I, my name's Kate Brown. I'm the managing editor of finder.com.au or finder as we just call it, which is one of Australia's, well, it's Australia's largest, most visited comparison site. Uh, we cover a whole bunch of things, but we do really zero in on things like finance, um, personal finance, superannuation, all the insurances, um, travel, shopping, um, a whole range of things. But really, Finder exists to help people make better decisions. Um, and part of my role, uh, beyond being the managing editor, I'm also the host of Pocket Money, which is uh, the Finder podcast. And I'm one of the media spokespeople for Finder as well. That's awesome. You have such a great background and I'm really, really keen to actually hear a little bit more about your story. But maybe just share with us on maybe any given day, what you kind of, I guess, in 60 seconds or less, what do you actually do? at the moment? Yeah, my background is fairly unusual. I've come from a background of journalism, but I've also done a lot of TV and broadcast work. And for me, it's all content. So I, I think these days with digital, um, you know, uh, my job's really interesting. So uh, day to day, I'm responsible for managing the finder.com.au website, uh, working with the writers, the publishers, uh, working with our p amazing PR and media team to look at getting stories out to the general media as well um, and being a spokesperson for Finder. So, for example, yesterday I was editing um, stories. I was putting together our own podcast. I then um, hopped out of my tracksuit pants and put on decent clothes to do an interview with Sunrise on Channel 7 in front of my house to talk about personal finance, uh, hop back into my pyjamas to then... Um, run a meeting with my team and um, talk about some of the things we're going to do coming up in the next couple of months. So it's a really varied job and, and that's why I really like it a lot. That's awesome and you must be feeling so privileged to be able to talk about that all in and, and share all that behind the scenes as well too because it sounds so exciting. I mean, it's all the glitz and the glam and stuff in front of the TV but uh, at the same time, you get to do it from home. <laughs> it's true and I did take a photo yesterday because, uh, you know, the, behind the glamour Tyrone, I think the photo of me wearing uh, jeans and bare feet standing out the front of my house but from sort of the waist up, I had a really nice top on, loads of makeup. Um <laughs> <laughs> cameraman shooting while my neighbors were wandering past like what are you doing is, is the, something happened to the street um but yeah i love um i love the news environment so i love i i'm at my best i think when i'm on my feet so if i get a call and say you got to do a, me a media interview in half an hour um that kind of stuff doesn't phase me weirdly i really enjoy the challenge and i really enjoy taking complicated information and, and making it sort of palatable and understandable because that's sort of where i came from um in terms of understanding stuff to do with finance or consumer stuff my background is consumer journalism so it's taking boring perceived as boring or complicated topics and breaking them right down hey that's awesome all right well let's lead into your story and just to get you know you personally kate yeah. maybe just share with us some interesting facts about your past firstly where did you grow up yeah, I grew up, um, born and raised in Sydney. Um, I feel like I'm one of the few people who <laughs> can say that. Um, actually, my partner was born in Sydney, but then he lived in the UK. Um, yeah, born and raised in Sydney. Uh, grew up in the sort of Hornsby area, so Normanhurst, oh. Hornsby area. Um, so quite suburban. Um, yes. Uh, I think it's given me a bit of a lifelong fear of living in the suburbs. My mum didn't drive, so I spent a lot of time living in that area catching lifts off other people and, and doing very long walks. So I think um, as soon as I could escape to the inner city, I did. Ironically, then I didn't drive myself for years, which is kind of funny. <laughs> but um, I, I blame on living in the inner city. Um, so moved to moved to the Sydney's inner west when I was about 20 um, and I've lived pretty much in the inner west uh, most of my life, apart from living overseas for a couple of years here and there and living in Bondi for a year when I met my partner who who enticed me to the, the eastern suburbs um, and I really enjoyed living there. And then uh, when it came time to buy a house and start a family, we... Surprise, surprise, ended up back in the inner west. Yeah. <laughs> How nice. 
<laughs> Let's talk a little bit about school as well. As you said, you grew up around the Hornsby Normanhurst area because I, yeah. I know the area quite well. You know, I, I actually kind of grew close to there, so it's not uh, too far. And I know the schools, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your schooling. Where did you kind of go to primary school, you know, high school? Just be curious about, you know, learning about your, your childhood yeah. kind of history. Yeah, I went to Hornsby South Primary School, which was a really cute little school, and I really enjoyed school. Um, I, I loved it from the day I started. My mum used to laugh. Um, I'm one of four kids. Two, uh, there's two girls and two boys. I'm the youngest. And my mum said, my sister and myself just walked into school on the first day in kindy and never looked back. And both wow. brothers cried. <laughs> Um, for many weeks, <laughs> and one brother is famous for saying, can't I just go sometimes? Um, so I think um, it's interesting. Maybe girls are, I think girls sometimes mature a little bit earlier than boys. And um, I loved school. Went to high school in Hornsby. I went to Hornsby Girls, uh, which is an amazing school. I loved high school. I I've, I've, I've always feel left out when people share their terrible high school stories because I definitely didn't have those. Um, it was a great school for being learning to be a good feminist for a start um you know this is in the this is in the late 80s and you know we were taught to be you know always that girls were equal to boys if not better um you know a bit of indoctrinating there which was great um and I think there was also a lot of freedom for me personally being at a, a girls only school um there wasn't the distraction of boys um or even just feeling I don't know, like we were quite rowdy. I remember we went on a school excursion once with a co-ed school and all of us girls from Hornsby Girls barreled under the bus and pushed all the boys off the back seat. And the teacher from the co-ed school was like, oh, but you're meant to be ladies. And we were like, (laughs) what? Uh, So we didn't have that kind of weird gender. I mean, a lot of that's gone away. And interestingly, my own child now begged to go to a co-ed school. I think things have changed a lot. But I really valued um, Hornsby Girls for that. they placed a lot of value on being academically um, inclined and to achieve, but also um, good focus on the arts, which I was really passionate about. Great music program, great art program. So I had a really happy school environment and I'm still friends with um, women I went to school with now. And, um, you know, I'm really proud of that. A lot of people walk out of high school and be like, never again. Yeah, you know, bye, um, see you later. I'm not coming back. <laughs> totally. And so uh, I really valued that and I think I learned a lot of really good lessons with that school. Mm. Didn't, didn't, do, didn't do so well when I left the um, school environment to go to university. That took a few goes, but <laughs> school was well, tell, us, tell, tell us about that. That's very interesting yeah. to hear about that. Um, is that sort of where also you got your creative and your arts and led you into yeah that side of things? So tell us about after going to finishing at Hornsby Girls into, say, university. Yeah, look, I think this is a good story for people freaking out about the HSC. I did pretty well in the HSC. I was a bit of a lazy student, though, I, but I was excellent at writing essays, which is how I think I ended up in journalism <laughs> uh, and I was a quick study so I could read something and regurgitate it really quickly. It's pretty hilarious. I've fallen into a job where that's what I do for a living. I'm not recommending that though. Um, <laughs> when I left school though, I think I wasn't really ready to leave school. I remember feeling quite sad about it and I went to Sydney Uni to do an arts degree and really when I look back, I don't know why. I, I, I think I wanted to do communications and I didn't get mm. in. And I wanted to do journalism. I didn't get in. The, um, the marks were super high. So I thought, oh, Sydney Uni, that looks really gorgeous I mean great way to base your you know university choice it's beautiful buildings it is Um, it's classic (laughs) it is very classic uh long trip from Normanhurst but worth it um and within a couple of months I was sinking I was drowning I had no idea why I was there um because you are given a lot of freedom at university I was like "Mm, you know if no one cares if I turn up to lectures maybe I won't um you know the logic that only an 18 year old can apply to um to study and I ended up dropping out and I remember being really sad but I just felt like a real fish out of water and of course my parents were like well you have to get a job and I was like oh oh god I do so I went away and worked for two years and I worked as a receptionist um and learned that I was the world's most disorganized receptionist um (laughs) and very messy and uh had three jobs uh one of which I got sacked from because I used to turn up late uh a lot and thought it was really unreasonable that they wanted me there at nine which I (laughs) I'm sharing with you now. I'm loving these scores. <laughs> I look back and think, oh my God, you know, and I see my own. Now I, I have a 12 year old. She's starting to tween. And I, you know, now I understand the logic. I think I was quite immature. So, long story short, those two years were really actually very instructive because I realized I didn't want to stay working in 
office work. Uh, I was a terrible receptionist. A lot of people are amazing office managers. I was not one of them. And I realized that was a poor fit for me. What it did do is finally kind of kicked me up the bum to reapply to uni and be really focused about what I wanted to do. And I guess for anyone who's stressing about the HSE, um, you know, two years out of school, I was already considered a mature age student. I applied to UTS to do social science with a major in communications. And I got in basically off the back of the essay I wrote about why I thought I should be allowed in. (laughs) In one of my jobs also, like I, I had a really elderly boss who called me honey and asked me to make cups of tea, which I refused to do, which eventually he found kind of funny. But for me, I was like, this isn't this isn't what I want to do for life. Um, and it really, for the first time um, at that age, so I was 20 by then, laser-like focus mm. on getting into this course. And I got in. I couldn't believe it. And I worked really, really hard when I was at uni the second time around, almost because I was like, did they let me in by mistake? Um, you know, a uh, bit of imposter syndrome and, and I worked my backside off um, then. So I think I, it's, I really like sharing that story because I think there's a lot of focus on being successful from the get-go or, you know, around the HSC, it's not. And really, I, if I got into comms straight from school, I reckon I might have dropped out anyway. I kind of needed that time out in the wild um, to really focus me. Some people have that natural focus, but for me, you know, when you're 18, you're a bit silly still. So um, that was very instructive and I had to do that on my own. My parents were pretty angry with me for dropping out of uni and kind of washed their hands of the whole thing. Um, So when I got back in, I really did that on my own uh, and they were a bit like, you're just going to drop out again? And I was like, I'm going to prove you wrong. (laughs) Um, so and you certainly did. <laughs> it, it did. So I think I think learning, you know, and like I said, as I'm a, I am a parent now of two daughters, I want them to build up that kind of drive and resilience a bit earlier. And I think schools probably do that a little better now. My school was very much like this lovely warm nest, you know, but then we got kicked out. It was like, my God, what is this? Um, so for me, I really needed those couple of years. And I think I've recommended this to, you know, other young people I've met. It's okay to have a couple of years out in the wild and learn some stuff or, you know. Totally. I, I think it's wise as well. They have mm. what they call, I think, some kind of exchange program or yes. gap year that's it what gap year yes and uh, i think i wish i did actually take that on if i had the chance to go looking back because that gives you real life experiences you it go does. straight to uni and you don't really get that real life experience until you actually finish uni and the hardest thing and i, I can admit i also failed as well first year uni because i didn't know what i was doing i was just playing yeah. around i went to play basketball all the time doing sports hanging out with other people and you just kind of forget don't worry about like just don't go worry about jutes and that's what happens and yeah. because that's the real life because i went to all boys school as well and oh, when you, you go to all boys school you, you get disciplined there but then you also get spoon fed but when you go out to real world and you don't get spoon fed you, you kind of go oh Who cares? Just leave it. And then you end up sort of slacking off. But when you actually get a big kick up the ass, which I did as well, yeah, uh, yeah, you realize, wow, I got to actually, you know, get back into gear and focus. And that's what happened to me. Second year, I made sure that I, I focused so hard and worked really hard to finish my degree off as well too. So, I totally agree with you. It's, it's yeah. needs a change. And I think due to the way the education system has evolved in the last few years as well too, it's not driven by basically the teaching anymore. It's driven by the students because yeah. everything is all student-based learning because everyone wants to do something different and everything is all focused around them. And I know UTS um, has changed everything to their learning way to actually focus the modules specifically for the students rather yes. than the teacher saying, this is what you've got to do for your course anymore. And yeah. I, I think that's what's more, more or less happening with the education sector for the next you know, decade or so. Yeah, it's I've I've noticed even now my 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 eldest daughter's just started year seven, bad year to start year seven. She's only there for five weeks and now she's in the, in her bedroom on her laptop, supposedly learning from home. But actually I've noticed how how student driven it is and there is an expectation for her to look after herself and she's already had a few kicks up the bum. Not 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 from me, but from from learning. And in fact even last night she said, Oh, I've got three assignments due next week on the same day. And I'm like, hmm, Mm. um, maybe you need to, you know, start one of them now. Um, But I think, you know, you learn a lot of lessons you learn in life by doing, not just being told. It's a rare person that goes, oh, thanks for telling me that lesson. You know, a lot of people need to learn. And, yeah, I'm a massive advocate for gap year. I um, didn't have one in terms of going overseas. I had one after I left uni actually and that that probably was the, the... 
I had a year overseas after I left uni, um, worked at a summer camp in America in the deep oh, south, which was pretty nice. wild. Um, learned a lot there. I lived in the UK, went traveling on my own through Turkey and Egypt. And I remember when I came home, people were like, wow, what's happened to you? Like you've really grown up. So almost I feel like that that year out after mm. the three years at uni was the, the final polish. <laughs> I finally came back as a proper <laughs> adult. <laughs> and I can remember, you know, like thinking, you know, this is, um, you know, I was traveling alone pre-internet um i'm showing my age um, <laughs> and, and be, losing my wallet in new york city and just thinking oh my god like wow i, I can only rely on myself mm-hmm. and i actually got it back but i remember there was a couple of hours where there i was like okay okay you've got this you can do this um but very formative, you know, and I really realized, you know, A, I was like, oh, I'm quite proud of myself. Um, but, yeah, traveling alone, um, going to country. I remember when I got to the States crying on the first night. I was very jet lagged, crying in my hotel room going, I don't know anyone in this whole country. Um, <laughs> it's isolated. scary. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I was terrified and I thought everyone was going to murder me or, you know, mug me. And, oh, yeah. you know, of course, as soon as I started at the summer camp, I met a million people and, people from all over the world and had an amazing time but yeah I think travel is a great thing for young people to do and yeah it's an investment in kind of you know your growing upness if that's <laughs> yeah, <word. very> true. <laughs> becoming adulthood <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's say. right yeah yeah so tell me a little bit more about this so after university you, yeah. you completed your your degree at UTS and yeah. then you took a year off and traveled yeah. over there summer camp how did you come across a summer camp like that like were they offered normally you know, afterwards or did you they just find out that? They're less popular for Australians but I'd met another um, woman when I was at uni that was going to go and do one. Um, suspiciously, I never heard what happened after she left to go there. <laughs> so I, I put that bit out of my mind. It's very um, common in the U- UK. So because the summers align with the US and the UK, you basically – you go as a volunteer and if you live in the UK, you get a free airfare chucked in and you get kind of minimum wage and you work. Wow. That's um, a pretty good deal. Yeah, not bad. For Australia, our way, our flight was subsidized, but I actually just bought a round-the-world ticket because I was going to be away for a year. Um, so you apply. I'd worked in an after-school care center when I was at uni, so that was my part-time job when I was at uni, which was funny because I was like, ugh, I'd hate children. Um, and then I realized working with kids was really fun. So that was kind of weird as well. Um, and and after-school care was great, like hours-wise, you know, you work sort of, in the mornings or in the late afternoon and so it sort of suited my uni lifestyle um and so I thought oh, yeah, I can work with kids this is a this is a way of um you know um getting a fairly cheap trip you know a, a structured activity so I knew I'd you know have an adventure but you know I'd probably meet other people um yep. and off I went and I also just said look I'm happy to go anywhere I didn't want to say you could put in preferences for where you wanted to go uh, uh, and I ended up, <laughs> I really did up anywhere. I ended up in a tiny little town in the deep south in the mountains, which is right down south, um, real hillbilly kind of town um, where people were Bible thumping, gun toting, oh, yeah, moonshine yeah. drinking uh, folk. Weirdly, the camp was for very wealthy children from Miami, but because the weather is so bad in Miami in the summer, it's so hot, they send them up to Georgia, which is quite mountainous and a bit cooler for the summer. So the kids hilariously were very urban, very wealthy, terrified of the outdoors. Um, (laughs) We're all there from the UK and Australia and New Zealand just going, what the hell, like, what are we doing here? Um, So the local town was quite literally full of, like, tobacco-chewing, gun-toting, hillbillies god fearing wow. hillbillies. And the kids were like incredibly sophisticated miami urbanites um i can like, imagine is there any security here <laughs> like none of them like were used to going hiking they'd all cry like um yeah so we were all thrown in the deep end together and it was possibly one of the hardest things i've ever done i had to live in a cabin with 12 nine-year-old girls and we shared a bathroom. Oh. um and I just sleep in a in a in a bunk uh, with them. And then by day, I was sort of teaching art and craft, so the kids can do all sorts of activities. And it looked just like every movie you've ever seen, where there's a summer camp involved, with the little yellow yeah. Simpsons buses, the cabins. Um, but what I did love, a again, it really challenged me 
you know, to dig deep because kids are pretty frustrating. Mm. <laughs> Saying that now I'm a parent, um, you know, I, there was a lot of negotiating and a lot of having to, you know, get everyone to do stuff. Um, a lot of, you know, putting out fires, sometimes figuratively, literally sometimes. Um, and just that, you know, there was a, and dealing with a different culture, Americans are so full on and the kids were so full on and very yeah, yeah. loud. And that to me was hilarious. And then working with a bunch of people from the UK who were different again. Um, I'm very proud to say well, I, I, I'm still friends with this guy. He'd been in the army in the UK and he quit the camp because it was too hard. So... <laughs> Now, that's a complete hilarious point of view because usually the army guys are the ones who you yeah, know, push so through. Yeah, so the rest of us are like, yeah. yeah. He's like, you know, he used to jump out of planes with a parachute and did a tour of Northern Ireland, but he are found the kids me? too hard. Um, <laughs> so that was, a, that was a great experience and I've still got friends that I met from that day, um, from that time in, you know, in the UK, in the US and New Zealand. And weirdly, that's actually how I met my husband, but. I met a whole lot of friends from around the world, UK, the US, New Zealand. Um, weirdly, I even met someone who ended up introducing me to my husband. Um, he wasn't at the camp and he's Australian. Um, she's from the UK and she actually introduced us. And bizarrely, uh, my husband actually grew up near Hornsby. So <laughs> What a small world. <laughs> I know. Uh, she she met him when he was living and working in London. And because we'd, we'd formed a real bond working on the summer camp, we stayed in, we stayed in touch for years. And... Um, um, when she came out to Australia, he'd moved back here and she introduced us. So oh, summer that's camp so paid nice. off in more ways than one. <laughs> <laughs> you know the way it comes back to small exactly. world. Exactly. Wow. Yeah, totally. I mean, we we figured we'd probably walk past each other at Hornsby Westfield, you know, when we're teenagers and ugh. Uh, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, now we're husband and wife. <laughs> exactly. He was from a fancy private school too. So I was like, oh, you were probably just like, ugh, you know, Hornsby girls. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. So I guess during that time, you, yeah. you've gone through, experienced, and did you? When did you come back to Australia, and at what stage did you jump in to start working for? Yeah. I guess? So I got back to Australia in the sort of mid nineties, um, and basically still wasn't sure what I wanted to do with myself. So, um, and jobs are we were coming out of recession, so jobs were still in fairly short supply. Um, and again, I just, you know, I still didn't know what I wanted to do career-wise. I wanted to work in journalism, but there weren't a lot of jobs at that point. And I think I still suffered from, suffered from a bit of lack of confidence. So I sort of fell into working at Optus, which was still in startup mode then. Um, you know, this really? is in the days when, you know, for all the young kids out there, uh, we used, you know, there was only Telstra um, when I was sort of a teenager and, and a young person. And then Optus came on the scene and provided like this actual market you know where there was competition and actually it was a great place to work it was there was a lot of money at, at when Optus started up a lot of investment in their staff um I worked in customer service for a while I worked as an account manager and got used to sort of angry, angry. um corporates <laughs> calling me um and actually I, and and looking back I, a it was just really good training in business um mm. it is a very unorthodox way to get into journalism um but again I think I learned a lot of skills and I learned about working in the corporate world I worked I learned to work with difficult customers. Again, I made some really great friends during that period. I worked a lot of shift work. And um, yeah, look, I think it was that was good. So I did that for a couple of years. And then I decided, funnily enough, um, oh, hang on, I, I really you know, should do something with this journalism degree. And I'd started writing freelance while I was at Optus um, for a couple of like music mags um, and a couple of street mags. And I was like, oh, I kept, I kept getting asked for more work. So I was like, Oh, actually, maybe I am quite, maybe I am okay at this kind of writing business and um, started to get paid a little bit of money, not enough to live on, but an, in, <laughs> enough to pocket money. Mm -hmm. And then I um, took a job at the Opera House, um, Sydney Opera House. So um, that was amazing. So I was working in sponsorship. So working with corporate sponsors, but working with them um, around media messaging, um, uh, promoting their brand with, with the Opera Houses. And that was a really fun creative job uh, yeah, I can and imagine. used a lot of my writing skills yeah but still grounded in business because ultimately the sponsors those sponsors are what keeps the op i mean the opera house is owned by the you know owned and run by the state government but yeah to put on the shows to put on the events especially the free public events sponsorship is really where that comes into play so i was there for seven years and i had an amazing time it's a very exciting place to work um 
the views are incredible. Um, Absolutely. I wonder what the culture was like. If you said it was an amazing place to work, what kind of culture did they actually, keep, I guess, in, in retain staff like yourself that were there for seven years? You yeah. would have had some amazing things to do. That's right. The building alone is not going to get you there, right? So the culture was um, the culture was amazing. My boss used to joke because we had to, to go to our office. Our offices were in the opera house at the time. Um, I used to have to walk through stage door. Uh, you know, often past like famous people or opera singers. And then to get to our particular office, we had to walk under a huge sign that said drama. And oh. my boss used to joke that that applied to every department in the building, whether it was finance and accounts, corporate, sponsorship, media, marketing. Um, a lot of it attracted a lot of vibrant people. And I guess all of us were really passionate about the arts. Um, so even, you know, even the people doing accounts, doing payroll, were super invested in the building, the culture. And and we were felt, we were all felt um, made to feel really important. So all of us had access to free tickets to shows and we were encouraged to go to shows. Um, all of us were encouraged to attend all the events. Um, they're extremely generous with things like New Year's Eve. We'd all be allowed to go to, you know, the events there and have tickets to, you know, the free events or some of the ticketed events. And I think that really made everyone feel like this was, you know, our building. Uh, you know, we'd talk about our opera house. And I think the culture there was really clever, um, particularly for public service, which can be a slow-moving environment environment the opera mm. house was a lot more dynamic and probably a bit atypical a bit like the abc um where there's a lot of pride and i mean you walk outside and there's people taking photos of where you work <laughs> and you of look course. back and it's you know it never got old for me yeah. i don't think there was a single day when i walked up to that building without just going oh um inside and out you know it it changes with the weather um it's the beating heart of sydney and like i said there was always crazy stuff going on. I was there during the Olympics, so that was super exciting. Wow. Um, you know, there was during the um, Iraq war protesters when protesters climbed up on the sails and painted on the sails, um, you know, through all kinds of things. And, you know, there was never a day where something didn't happen that was a bit exciting. Absolutely. And, um, Such an iconic yeah. building. I mean, look at, it look at it for New Year's Eve. Everyone points their eyes straight on that next to the Harbour Bridge. It's like, yes. <laughs> how could you not miss it, that? It was amazing. And, and our, our original office was on the ground floor right at the front of the building. So I looked almost directly into water. So I had boats going past my window. Um, you know, I could see the storms come in and leave. And and I worked with a really great team of, it was an all-woman team and we're all similar age, um, really dynamic. We really, you know, we, we, we got shit done, but we had a lot of fun um, on the way. And um, I, I really, I really loved it. And it did actually... Again, I've had a very unorthodox, as you're probably guessing, I had a very unorthodox entry into kind of pure journalism. But while I was working at the Opera House, I was also working as a freelancer by that stage for the Sydney Morning Herald um, and News Limited and doing a lot of feature writing. And, and actually, look, my boss at the time is very supportive of that too. She was often you know, really helpful and supportive. And that kept me really invested in my day job as well. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So uh, I guess uh, you worked there for seven years, which yeah. is quite a, a, a quite a reasonable amount of time. Yeah. After that, where did you go, and um, how did you end up in finance as well? Yeah. So after I finished at the Opera House, uh, I met my now husband, and we did what all mature thirty-year-olds do, and <laughs> quit our jobs and went overseas for a year. Um, we did, and um, we uh, we went to South America for nine months traveled around South America, volunteered working with wild animals in Bolivia for a month, um, Wow! worked with uh, disadvantaged kids in Peru and then we came home sort of via Southeast Asia, worked in the elephant orphanage as volunteers. Um, that was all very exciting but actually that was a good reset because then what I, 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 I remember saying after that year, also it's like in my early, very early 30s and I was like, okay, I need to get real. Like I want to be a journalist full time. And I said to Ed, my partner, that's it. I, that's what I want to do. And believe it or not, I, I was like, we're in Thailand on an island. I'm like, oh, better start looking for jobs. We're going to go home soon. And I started looking and I saw a job at Choice, which is the Australian Consumers Association. They're looking for a journalist, um, part-time journalist. And I applied and um when I got back, I was really worried. They think, why has this woman been overseas for a year? And actually, they were fantastic. They also were very supportive of, you know, what I'd done and my freelancing and, and I got the job. So I worked at Choice um, 
first as a news journalist um, and I was still freelancing on the side. I then moved to becoming an investigative journalist. So that was really exciting. Um, Chase a lot of big stories. Choice doesn't accept advertising or funding. So Choice is very free to kind of pursue big companies, wrongdoings without any fear or favor. And that was a really exciting time. I slowly then moved into managing a team. So by by the end of my career at Choice, I was a lifestyle editor. So I was running a team of about five journalists, an investigative journalist, health uh, writer, uh, food writer, working with our pol- the policy team there who do a lot of campaigning for good work. And by then I had um, fallen into media spokesperson work as well. I think as you probably can tell by this interview, I don't mind talking. <laughs> um, and uh, We didn't have a media spokesperson at Choice for a little while and someone said, hey, do you think you could go on Sunrise and <laughs> talk about groceries? And I was like, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, and that was a bit of a baptism of fire. So my ever, first ever TV appearance was on Sunrise being interviewed by David Koch. Um, and it couldn't have, it went okay on screen, but it couldn't have gone worse behind the scenes. They forgot to tell me when they needed me in the studio. So I was still sitting on a couch. They hadn't done my makeup properly, which is kind of a necessity on TV. As I was being chased into the studio as they were saying we're going live in 30 seconds um, <laughs> I could feel someone unzipping the back of my dress and stuffing a microphone pack down the back of my dress <laughs> and trying to zip it up I kind of landed out in the studio floor there's David Koch who's a giant in real life I'm like oh my god and then it was like three two one and I'm thinking I don't even know if my dress is done up Anyway, I did the interview. It turns out I performed well under pressure. So I did that and it was fine. Uh, no one knew that uh, everything that happened beforehand. So I started doing quite a bit of media work, which complemented like the work I was doing for Choice mm-hmm. in terms of my investigation. So we did a lot of research, a lot of deep dives into things. Um, not uh, Yeah, around that time as well, I Choice started working with ABC um, on a consumer affairs show called The Checkout. Mm. Um, which is weirdly uh, an idea from the guys who run The Chaser, so very, very funny guys who worked in a lot of satire, particularly around politics. They wanted to do something on consumer stuff. Um, Julian Morrow, um, who's very funny, you know, he said, oh, I'm a classic whinger, I'm always whinging about my consumer rights, you know, um, I've decided to make a whole show and we're going to make it funny. And I was like, consumer affairs isn't funny. Sometimes it's just really boring. And um, I started... I just started, I met with them a couple of times at Choice and had some story ideas and then I got a call from the CEO at Choice at the time going, can I talk to you? And I'm like, oh, no, what have I done? Oh, no. <laughs> um, and he said, oh, the, the guys from The Chaser want to have a chat with you, oh, um, you know, about story ideas. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. So I met with Craig Rucastle, Julian Morrow, Chaz Lichardello from The Chaser and Suggested a couple of stories and then um, I was a fairly new parent at that time. So I was like, there's a lot of consumer bullshit around parenting products yeah, and all the things right. you supposedly need. And Craig sort of suggested doing a, a parenting segment that we call the guilty mum rather than a busy mum, a guilty mum. Mm. Uh, so I started writing for that segment and doing a lot of research and then the guys asked me, how do you feel about being on camera? <laughs> I was like, oh. <laughs> Maybe. And then they were like, we think the only way to get away with this particular segment is to play a character you're going to have to act. And I was like, oh, okay, I guess I'll give it a go. And so I sort of made this character secretly based on a few women in my mother's group. Um, I played this character um, really skewering all those products that are designed to make parents feel guilty. So they were very funny. I really enjoyed writing them. It was great therapy. (laughs) <laughs> you know, it was like products like, I don't know, crash helmets for kids learning to walk. I mean, my God, like, you know, kids have been learning to walk for centuries. Exactly. Um, you know, baby yogurt that's twice the price as regular yogurt and doesn't have anything different in it. You know, I, I could go on. Um, and so I worked on the show and also did other segments as well. Um, and that was amazing. A, it, they were really generous to allow me in front of a camera and, and to be so creative and be to learn how to write scripts, which is very different from writing mm. to, to be read. You know, my first instincts when I started writing scripts was to talk everything and they're like, you know, you've got, this is a visual medium. You can show, you don't have to tell. There's graphics, there's sound effects. Um, 
and I, I learned to write comedy with some of the funniest people in Australia, which was equally mortifying and instructive. Yeah. Wow. That would have been an amazing experience. I'm, I'm already seeing like so much of the story unravel to learn so much about your past and your history. Yeah. You would have faked away so much. Are you still doing any of those things right now? Uh, I'm not. Like, sadly, the checkout got axed um, in 2018, which was a real bummer. Um, it was they, uh, the ABC, I think, you know, it's really getting stripped bare. And the show, the show was pretty budget friendly, but because it it wasn't a panel show. It, it was all scenario based. A lot of dress ups, a lot of um, props and stuff. They they couldn't just fight, which was a real shame because for six years had really good ratings and it was, yeah. you know, really helped people. I, I was astonished. I was at an event once where uh, a bunch of boys from Normanhurst Boys um, at High School, their teacher came up and said, "Oh, the boys love the checkout." And I was like, "Wow!" And they went, "They really love your segment." And I'm like. My segment's about being a mum, being a parent. And he said, yeah, but they like the fact you're, like, you're sort of taking the piss and they really love the fact you're taking the piss out of these stupid products, not parents themselves. And I was like, okay, if you can get teenage boys interested, you know, like comedy's a really good hook to do that. So um, the checkout finished up. Um, I'd been at Choice for a long time, so I was looking for a new adventure and I was approached to join Finder. And um, the job for me was a real unicorn job because it's 50% media spokes work. 50% editorial, which is an unusual, usually people that work in editorial, not always, but a lot of those people don't want to front something on camera. Equally, people that do media spokes work often don't do editorial. So for me, it was like, oh, this is an amazing job. Um, Perfect. Yeah. And um, I've absolutely, I've been a finder for a year and a half and it's extraordinary. It's got the best culture of anywhere I've worked, um, even the opera house. Um, <laughs> Real can-do culture, um, very hands-on. Everyone jumps on things. Everything works at speed, which I really appreciated after, particularly after the Opera House and Choice, who were a bit more, a bit slower, a bit more old-fashioned in their approach. Um, Choice was very cautionary, I guess, as well, because it, you know, mm. positions itself as being an expert, fine as expert as well. But what I learned is you can move fast, you can get something up and make it better as you go along, um, and you can chase stuff. And you can, you know, we have a, a core belief at Finder is you know, go live, you know, go live with something, give it a go, see how it happens. And for me, it's just been really refreshing. And um, you know, we're allowed to experiment a lot. Um, mm. And, you know, it's okay and, and learning that it's okay to fail. Um, and in a way, ironically, we don't fail a lot, I think, because people don't have that fear. Um, so, you know, people really throw everything at something, throw it at the wall. Um, so it's a really great environment. We do so much work in c the consumer area. But I guess for me, um, I was a little bit reticent about joining finance because it is so finance focused and I'd always stayed away from finance. Um, and I was a little bit frightened of finance. It seemed a bit complicated. And um, someone very wise who works there said to me, but that's perfect because you can explain it to people like yourself out there in the world. Not everyone's a finance expert. So speak to the regular people because they're the people that we want at Finder. You know, we're taking complex topics and breaking them down. That's right, um, yeah. So for me, it's been really interesting. And what's been really unexpected is I've kind of fallen in love with finance. Um, <laughs> as, <laughs> as, as we would expect. <laughs> yeah, and even things like superannuation or, you know, insurance, like that. They affect your life and money, personal finance is everyone's life. So to ignore it is crazy because you can't ignore it. Like everyone's a consumer, everyone spends money, even my kids spend money. Um, and so you got to know your money to do good things with it and, and make it worth your time. If you're going to work and earn money, which most people have to do, then you should do do your time the justice by focusing on it. Yeah, Totally. And that, that really ties in really well because I think, the interesting thing is if you're investing into property, you also got to be dealing with money. So, which ties yep. in really well um, to yes. talk about this next part is let's explore your property investment journey and even just your property journey. Tell us a little bit about your first property that you purchased because yes. that I think is going to be exciting to share. Yeah, look, I uh, this is before I was working at the Opera House. I <laughs> I was renting, uh, you know, renting a, a place with a friend in the inner west. I'd been single forever. I was pretty happy being single, <laughs> floating along. And then my flatmate and good friend, he said, look, I'm going to move to London. I'm like, oh. And then I just thought, oh, God, I don't know what I'm going to do. But, I, you know, classic 20-something, you know, I was just like, oh, whatever. And then my dad... Um, said, I, I want to have, mum and I want to have dinner with you, which was really unusual. Like my mum was quite fairly hands-on parent, but my dad wasn't so much. Um, and 
I thought, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> so I went out for what dinner with them. Coming? Single, not earning a lot of money. I was like, woo, like free dinner. Went at dinner with them and then my dad is like, kind of was like, what are you doing with your life? Like, you know, what are you going to do in the immediate future, which is your flatmates just moved out? Like, you know, what are you doing? I think I was... I think I'd left Optus too and I was between jobs then and I was I was just very late, didn't know what I was doing with my life. And I was like, oh. And then he said, look, I, you know, your mother and I are a bit worried about you. Um, I think you should try and save some money with a mind to possibly buying either somewhere to live or something to invest in. And I was like, oh. Okay. And then he was like, look, uh, and I was very, very fortunate. My parents by this stage were living in Leichhardt in, you know, the inner West. So I was the last youngest child. So um, they had a nice house in Leichhardt with a spare room. And dad was like, why don't you come and live at home for a year instead of continuing to rent and pay the rent, but I'll sock it away in an account Uh that you can't touch. And I was like, hey, dad, that's a great idea. (laughs) is so generous um and actually when i look back again (laughs) having your you know adult child move back in isn't a walk in the park either i've got that perspective now i'm a parent so it was actually a very very generous thing to do and so i did um i only lasted six months in their house um (laughs) i can understand this happens i've done it before it's not easy living with the parents again (laughs) once you have that freedom it's like i don't want to ever go back it was hard and I think my mum found it really hard too. Like, I, you know, I again, with that kind of selfishness you have when you're young, it's like, oh, she must love having me here. And I think my mum was just like, oh, you know, because I actually did revert to a bit of a child, even though I was in my, you know, late 20s. Um, I wasn't really behaving very well. I just went back to my child me, which I think we do around our parents sometimes. That's right. Yep, yep. <laughs> uh, so we all agreed after six months that would come to an end. And around then a good friend of mine had said, hey, like we're looking for a new flatmate in our share house. And my mum was quite cross because I think, and my dad, they were like, well, clearly you'll stop saving. But I didn't. Um, I kept saving, albeit not quite at the rate I was when I was socking away what I would have spent in rent. Um, and almost to go to them, hey, you know, um, I even, and I, I went overseas with a friend for six weeks and, you know, they were like, oh, great. You know, and I think they were like, she spent all the money, but I didn't. And I set up an automatic transfer, which is the greatest thing to do in the world. Um, you know, and it seems so simple now, but at the time I was like, oh God, I'm not even noticing that money. And by then I'd started working at the Opera House and that money was just going into a high interest savings account. Uh, it took me probably a year longer than my parents expected, but after two and a half years, I had enough money for a deposit on a very, very small apartment. And That's so, amazing. Yeah. And look, you know, and I, 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 what I realized is, you know, sometimes you hear about saving or budgeting and you think, oh, I'm going to have to like, I don't know, drink tap water and never have a coffee or go out ever again. Eat rice um, every day or <laughs> can of beans. Yeah, a can of beans. Um, and it doesn't have to be like that. Obviously, you'll save more money if you do that, but you can still save money and a lot of it's a mindset. And so for me, like I said, just the automatic debit from my payment, I never saw it. And I just adjusted and I had a bloody good time living in that other share house with my other friends. I had a great time. Actually, it didn't hurt that two of them were students. So I was working and they were sort of students. So we did, you know, we partied a lot at home. (laughs) (laughs) Accidental kind of saving things, I guess, in that way too. But I did, I saved enough. And by then, mum and dad were really out of the picture, like not in a bad way, but I'd kind of gone, I've got this. And so I started looking for, you know, a very small apartment. Um, I had enough for you know, up to a 20% deposit, um, was hoping for 10 um, and started looking at places in the inner west. At that stage, sort of Marrickville was still pretty affordable. Um, it wasn't quite the way it looked these days. Um, it's changed a lot. Yeah. Both my brothers lived in Marrickville and they both had, apartments uh, over there and so one of my brothers took me to look at a few places and it didn't go well um I remember looking at one and coming out and crying because I said (laughs) I'd be too scared to live here um it was pretty rough it was like pretty rough but and I remember my brother going but it's such a good price you know and I'm like oh um 
And I was like, I can't do that. I, I looked in other suburbs. It was a lot of, um, you know, I was astonished by how many people were looking in that price range too. So you'd have to queue up to like look at a one-bedroom yeah. apartment. Um, it was really depressing and I looked for quite a long time. Um, but I did have one of those magical moments. So I'd looked and looked and looked and I was just thinking, oh, and then I started thinking, well, I could buy something and I don't have to live in it. You know, yeah. and, uh, suddenly I went, oh, I could actually, you know, I guess it's rent vesting. I just didn't realize it was rent vesting uh, because I was really enjoying living with my friends and I really like living in Leichhardt and I couldn't afford to stay in Leichhardt and, you know, like real dodgy end of Marrickville on my own. I was like, oh, it's not really, you know, single, not really doing it for me. That really liberated my mindset. Um and then I remember sitting with uh, my other brother in the pub one day in Marrickville and I pointed across the road because his apartment block was across the road and I said, oh, it's just I'm, I'm so done looking at places. I'd looked at about 30 places by then. I was getting really discouraged and I waved my hand in the direction of his apartment block and said, I just want something like that. And unbelievably, he said, oh, my girlfriend's friend has a really small apartment in there and she's looking to sell privately. <laughs> and I was like, hang on a minute, what? Um, and so he introduced me to her and um, I bought my first place privately. <laughs> which was, Wow, that is an amazing story. Yeah. You don't hear that very often. No. That's a great deal. Yeah. Um, it was good in the sense that we were able to kind of come to an arrangement um, without real estate investor, uh, real estate agents and all the, dare I say, yeah. bullshit you get. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it was difficult, um, because just as I was, I'd finally, I got, um, I had a lot of trouble getting a loan. Um, banks don't like, like lending to single women <laughs> and particularly when they work in the arts and weren't earning a great salary, an okay salary, like enough yeah. to cover it. But I, and also they didn't like the size of the apartment. It was oh. not a studio. But it yep. was just under 50 square meters, even though Ooh, it was perfectly. Okay. And so suddenly I was just getting no's all around. Mm. Um, so that was another massive hurdle. Uh, wow. And I did use a mortgage broker who was actually really great. Um, and they finally found someone that would lend, but I had to pay a 20% deposit. Ouch. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I guess the other thing about selling privately is just before we were about to do the deal, um, the woman I was buying it from got cold feet. Oh. And she called me and asked for an extra thirty grand. <laughs> I uh, think it's like, yeah. So what did you do in that circumstance? <laughs> it was funny because she called me and I was at work and I, I, you know, and and for me I was doing all this stuff I'd never done before. So I was in that very kind of heightened state where I'm like dealing with mortgage brokers, dealing with conveyances. Well, I didn't even know what a conveyance was, um, you know, getting the money ready. You know, I was like, wow, I was so into it and I was so excited. And she called me at work and someone must have got in her ear and gone, oh, you know, you could get more. And she started saying, I think I'm going to auction it. And I was like, mate, it's like a tiny one-bedroom apartment. And particularly this is, you know, this is like 15 years ago. People weren't doing that in Marrickville. Like you weren't having auction, and she would have lost, like you know, and and so I actually called her bluff, but it was sort of unintentional. I basically just said to her, "Well, I don't have any more money." So, <laughs> and yeah, I was take like, it or leave it. I said, "I don't have any more money down the back of the couch." Like so, that's a real shame because I love it and I'm I've got the money ready to go. And I said, yeah, take it or leave it. If you think you can get more, I'm really, really sad, but that's that. And we left it and I was so upset. And she called me back two hours later and she said, I've changed my mind. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it, um, that's what happens. It was interesting because it wasn't, like I said, it wasn't really deliberate, but it was actually, I did call her bluff, but truly because I, I, I was already extended. And I think, you know, I think she just had a moment of madness herself, but it was like, come on, seriously, we're not paying any real estate agent fees. We're not paying, you know, money you'd pay for an auction. I'm solid. You know me, you know, I've got the money. Um, and a couple of days later, we exchanged the keys in the pub that I'd been sitting in with my brother when I'd been looking across the road. So that was awesome. Yeah, yeah. That's a very memorable moment. I love that story. Your first property. It's yeah. it's a very, very interesting one because I haven't really heard of something like that before. But no. at the same time, it starts your whole journey. 
And, and since then, uh, you've purchased your home. You know, yes. you, have you have purchased any other more investment properties as well since then? So after I bought my property, um, I lived in it for a little while, and then I decided I, I, I didn't want to live in it, so I moved back to my share house. Um, and actually, I then got to be a landlord, which was really interesting um, again. And it's you know, um, I worked with a really nice local agent um, to find my great tenants and I think I, I like to think I was a pretty good landlord um, and they all looked after my place beautifully. Later on, I was able to, able to help out a friend who was saving for his own place. So he moved into my place and, um, you know, uh, in return for, a, you know, small cut in the rent, he kind of offered to look after things and, you know, we, we had an arrangement, which was awesome. And also I was able to help him buy his own place. Um, and I was happily still living in my share house. So really, again, my, my first property was an investment. It really was set and forget, you know, the rent covered the mortgage repayments. Um, you know, I had a few upsets with, you know, water heater blowing up or the occasional, you know, extraordinary strata fee. But I had it covered and it really was set and forget. So I guess that's like really important thing to say to people. It's the buying is hard, but often you, you know, so it sat there ticking away. I met my partner. He also had his own place, uh, again, an apartment, but in Bondi. And when we got really serious and we wanted to start a family, um, you know, we both realized we weren't millionaires and we couldn't stay in Bondi. Um, and, uh, he was in a one bedroom apartment too. We um, found a house in Leichhardt and the market had taken a bit of a dive at that point. This is sort of mm. mid 2000s. Um, I'd always thought Leichhardt would be out of our ballpark financially. I thought we'd probably look in Merrick Villa it chill but um again you know so much of buying property is circumstantial um mm. we saw this house we live in now um because we we're driving past i knew the street i'd always loved the street and i used to look at this the house i own now and go oh it's such a cute little house and it was for sale it was for auction i said to my partner there's no way we can afford this. It's Leichhardt. This is one of the nicest streets. And um, my husband's far more optimistic than me. He goes, I'm just going to ring up and yeah. find out. And I was like, don't bother. And he's like, no, no, I'm going to. And this is the story of our relationship. He's definitely more of a glass half full guy. He called and they said the, uh, it was passed in an auction. Uh-huh. And they said the owners are getting divorced. It's very acrimonious and they want to sell fast. So, distressed property sale um, opportunity <laughs> yeah and it was uh the first place we looked at and again my my dad was really interesting my dad's great with sort of property stuff um we we came i got my mum and dad to come over and have a look at it and my dad said make an offer and my mum said but it's the first place i've looked at and my dad said well why would you want to keep looking and exactly. my mum's like that's insane and I'm like maybe we should look at other places and my dad said do you really want to be looking for the next year and talking about how that first place so yeah, I do take my hat off to my dad he's he's carefully spontaneous and um so we were able to sell the two properties we had in in Bondi and Marrickville to buy the house so um oh that's so good which was great because four months later I was pregnant so <laughs> And we literally bought a, you know, a, a house with a white picket fence. So people were highly amused. I'd gone from being very single to very um, loved up and then pregnant within sort of two years. So that was, and owning a house. So that was pretty wild. Um, I'd love to invest more in property. I guess what we have done as an investment with our house is um, we did do a significant renovation two years ago and partly from necessity but also strategically. So um, the house had three bedrooms but a very small living area and a very small bathroom and the classic Victorian home, the front was really solid but the back was a bunch of rough and tumble extensions that were all falling to bits. Mm. Um, so we we reborrowed um, to fund a major renovation to turn the house into four bedrooms, um, two bathrooms um, and a much larger living area and it's it's very beautiful now and also rock solid. So um, the reason I say strategic is we really squeeze that fourth bedroom in because I talked to a lot of real estate agents about what people were looking for in the market if we were to sell. And the one thing that's in shortage around the Leichhardt inner west area is four bedroom houses. Yes. There's a lot of three bedrooms. 
Um, they're very small rooms. The girls' rooms, my children's rooms are fairly small. But I think um, what, the, and, and, and talking to a lot of agents was very instructive. Um, you know, agents love looking at your house, even if you're not going to sell in areas where there's interest. And I learned a lot from them. And actually, a lot of them were very honest. Like two of them, we were looking at potentially selling and buying something else rather than renovating. And two of them just said, don't sell. You won't do better than this in terms of location, mm. which I thought was really honest. Um, and but a lot of them said, "Look, people are looking for the fourth bedroom because that's the golden. Like, if people have three kids, or they want to study, or they just want another space, that's the golden ticket." Um, so we were able to work. We, we have a friend that actually designed the house for us, and we paid her. But it was great to work with someone that knew us really well. But that's been very strategic. So while I do see us staying here for quite some time. I wanted to build something that would be very appealing to the market if we needed to sell. Totally. And the great thing about doing an add-on like what you've done there to add value to your existing property is when you do go back and get it revalued, there's going to be equity there and especially in the Sydney market and yes. in the, a very, very high in demand suburb like you live in which is Leichhardt. So, there's lots of opportunity to be able to expand from there in the future as well. So, strategically, you've done a very, very smart move and I totally agree that yeah. something like that for the investors to hear about that, you know, I've had previous investors have invested a lot more money back into their own principal place of residence because they know that they can leverage off that as well in the future. And yeah. you know, that's a very smart move to do because you don't have to you know, worry about paying capital gains tax down the track and you know, all that's these other right. things as well. <laughs> it's interesting when we bought the house, my husband's accountant was like, oh, why don't you just stay in the Bondi apartment and negative gear the house? And, I, and that's where I think sometimes financial advice and life collide. And I looked at him and said, but I want to live in, I bought the house so I could live in it. And also, I, I mean, he didn't know this, we were planning to have children. So I was like, am I having children in a one bedroom of Bondi apartment? Um, but, you know, sometimes investing can be your own home, like you said, for equity. Obviously, the property market will be interesting to see what happens going forward. But I think the optimistic side of me is in those areas where there's demand and there's always going to be demand in cities like Sydney and Melbourne and all the big capital cities. If you have a suburb that has good public transport, good schools, good access to the city, for example, but a nice kind of um, lifestyle, yeah. while we might see some drops, I think it should all even out if it's if, if we're looking oh, for a long-term play. I'm not definitely. looking to turn it over in a week. Um, no. So for us, that's really where we did invest. And like I said, we needed to. Like, you know, my girls are going to be teenagers soon and they're definitely going to need a bathroom. Um, so in that sense, it was a necessity. And also we, we were sort of bursting at the seams. Um, but, yeah, we, we were strategic. Um, you know, aesthetically, I, I battled with our architect because she was like, you'd have – three really nice bedrooms you know or she wanted to make that fourth bedroom an open space and I was like no I want a door <laughs> I need a door and a window in there and look we do use it as you know it's a great guest room it means my daughters can have their own room but I, I was really bullish on the four the four bedrooms and the two bathrooms because I knew from looking at the market that's what was in short supply yeah totally and that's a very smart move especially you know you're planning so in advance for what potentially could be and as you know you know any actually any property that you have an extra bedroom straight away the valuation goes up because it's that extra value. So yeah. whether it be small or, or you know big, it's that extra bedroom. People perceive it as a high value property. So yeah. that's that's a great thing. Yeah. Um so I guess what I'm I'm curious about then is jumping into more sort of financial, I guess, strategies and yeah. so forth like that, because that's what you talk about on pocket yeah. money and so forth. What do you think you could actually pass on to investors in terms of how to actually manage their money in this kind of climate and how to improve on that because it, yeah. it is quite a challenge, you know, like especially as you know, you've got two two young kids who are teenagers. How do you how do they save up to buy their investment properties or even buy the first property? Yeah, look, it's terrifying and we, we joke that the kids will probably be living with us forever. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you have a fourth bedroom. <laughs> maybe I'll be, yeah, maybe I'll be moving out. Um, it's going to be super hard. I mean, that's that's the thing about real estate prices and I feel we were, you know, we probably still paid more than we should have but I feel like when we did buy in the mid-2000s, it was before things got, you know, I think, think prices were crazy, now they're insane. Um, and then with this added issue around job security at the moment and also like younger generations, you know, not having that stable employment, like a lot of contract work, you know, it can be hard. I think just in terms of investing, often just going back to basics. So, you know, things like just look at optimizing your savings. Where can you save? It's a mindset, I think, for me. That was where the light bulb went off for me. Like I used to hear budget, like I said, and joke and think oh, that means eating beans and not having coffee. Um, it's about looking for where you can cut the fat 
without compromising what you want to do day to day and playing a long game. So I guess what I learned from saving that deposit is it took longer than originally expected, but I got there. And by changing, making some simple changes, things paid off in dividends. So for me, it was just taking that chunk of money out of my pay every week, making sure it was in the highest interest um, savings account I could find. Um, Behaviorally, it was um, one I couldn't access easily. You know, things like that, a term deposit, you know, they're just, they're very accessible things to do. And I think also um, something that working at Fine has really taught me is there's loads of way to save money that people just don't. So, you know, comparing and saving your energy providers. We've we've got research that shows you can save from four hundred to a thousand dollars a year just by swapping energy suppliers. I mean, that's a couple of phone calls and filling out a form. That's not bad work. Um, you know, super funds. Um, even if you have a home loan, like you know. Change, you know, looking to get a new home loan, interest rates are historically low. But even the ACCC put out a report recently saying less people are shopping around and, and swapping out their home loans than they expected. And people are losing potentially $5,000 a year. Um, wow. Yeah, in terms of interest. So behaviorally, I think, you know, often we have blind spots. And I think sometimes we over-engineer this stuff. And what I've learned from working at Finer, I used to be a bit frightened of money, thinking, oh, it's very complex. A lot of this stuff isn't complex. We use complex language. Um, banks and financial institutions possibly deliberately use very co- complicated language. A lot of it is actually pretty basic. And I look at someone like the Barefoot Investor who gives, you know, his book's been so successful because he literally tells you what to do. And, and That's right. that information's already there, but it's about... I'm going to tell you what to do and you can trust me. And through that, he's been phenomenally successful. And I guess I'd encourage any investor, whether they're saving so they can invest, you know, there's never been more information available. But what, 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 where we see the disconnect is people, they know it, but they don't do it. So you need to think about what are the things that are stopping me from actually doing that? What are the things from stopping me from today getting a better deal on my health insurance or my energy provider or optimizing my savings? Um, What are the things that I could do? You know, can I make a list of things that I'm going to do in the next three months? You know, um, don't overcomplicate things. Um, At the end of the day, like like I said before, like you work, you go to work, um, you earn the money, respect your money by looking after it. And if you don't know your money intimately, you can't grow it or do anything with it. So the first tip is not to be an ostrich. <laughs> I always joke about ostriches and eagles and I was definitely an ostrich for a long time um, until my dad sort of pulled my head out of the sand. It was like, what the hell are you doing? Um, and I think for me, like, you know, I was definitely not naturally attuned to thinking like that and even I found it very interesting and um really challenging and I felt a great sense of achievement too. So I think, you know, if you are looking to invest, um, educate yourself, um, you know, and now with online and with apps, there's so many ways you can do that. So find out what suits you as well. You know, if it's as simple as naming an account you want to put savings in, naming it after the thing you want, um, you know, there's lots of, there's a lot of psychology that comes into play. And I don't think in the financial space, we always talk about that. And I'm really fascinated by consumer psychology. Um, you know, it's like, we know it, but we don't do it. So you've really got to really have a long, hard look at yourself and think, what are the things that are stopping me? And just start with one. You don't have to do everything straight away. It's a long game. Totally. And property is a long game, a very long totally. game. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a very interesting. And you mentioned a point about superannuation. I actually wouldn't mind touching a little bit yeah. about that because that's a very, very interesting topic. Yeah. How can people actually maximize that? Because the challenge is there's so many different funds out there. There's so many different options. Yeah. And it can be a, a big, big forest of information that people just throw out at you. How yeah. have you been able to unbunk that for the actual investor or consumer out there? Yeah, look, uh, you know, a bit of a plug for Finder. We compare superannuation funds so you can look at who's charging the highest fees, um, you know, who's paying the best returns. Also, um, another really key thing, I think particularly for, uh, you know, younger generations and myself, we really care about where our money's being invested. So, you know, uh, I spoke to Future Super recently who are fascinating. Um, They only invest in, um, you know, ethical and sustainable investments Uh, products and markets and they were saying the big connect for their customers to be really engaged with their super is actually realizing that you know it's your money even now even though you can't get to it 
it's your money and it's being invested somewhere. Um, and I thought that was a real light bulb moment for me. So you that's power. So how you want to use that power, whether it's you want to use that power to make sure your money is going into funding great things. If it's about optimizing your own super, which you can do as well, um, you know, look at those fees, look at who's paying out the best returns, look at the mix of what they're investing. Again, all this stuff's available online now. Um, there's really no excuse for not doing it. It can seem overwhelming, but again, um, a lot of um, a lot of super products or super um, funds, and including Finder who compares them, can actually take your information and make suggestions about what would be most suitable for you. Um, again, t- leaning back on psychology, it's very hard to think about yourself in the future. Um, it's too hard. <laughs> a lot of people I ask to- about this question, five, 10 years, you know, what are you, what are you plans to do that? They're like, I don't know. It's too far away. I'm only looking for the now or even the next six months. Yeah. And look, um, I, I'm the same. Now I'm, you know, I'm in my 40s. I'm looking that that's not as far away, uh, but as human beings, and I, I I work quite closely with a consumer psychologist, and he said human beings don't like thinking about the future. We're not wired up to think like that. Oh, I've lost you. Did you hear that? Yeah, I'm still, yeah, yeah, heard you. Oh, good. Heard you. <laughs> yeah, um, human beings aren't wired up to think about their future selves. We don't. That's not how our brains work. <laughs> In defense to all of us, um, it's it can true. be tricky. Uh, but gee, it pays off to do it quite literally. Um, I used to say super was boring as well. Super is really interesting and I'm really for women. Women retire with half the super that men do currently in Australia and women over 55 are the fastest growing homeless group in Australia. So for the women out there uh, in particular, you need to keep an eye on your, like the reason that is for is a lot of, you know, a lot of structural inequality around parenting and unpaid leave and stuff like that. Um, But, you know, Think of it like that. Think about where you're going to be um, at retirement age and and really make that investment. Now, again, it can, I wouldn't say set and forget, but it is something if you take a bit of care on it once a year, you know, you're going to you're gonna really reap some benefits long term. And, yes, it's not sexy and it's not next year, but it's super important and it is an investment and that is your money that's out there right now. So think about where it's going and who it's funding and if you're okay yeah. with that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's it's the compounding effect, and that's the thing. People yep. don't see that. No. You know, maybe one or two years, it's a little bit, but then when you actually span it over 10, 20, 30 years, gosh, that effect really multiplies. And and, and that's the same thing, I guess, with property. Is that yes. people ten years ago who brought property now are doubled in value, and they don't realize that until they actually see it. Yeah. And it's always about hindsight when you go back. Hmm, I wish I bought that earlier <laughs> or started investing. <laughs> Like me so, wishing I'd bought that apartment that I was frightened of all those years because it was literally half of what the apartment I ended up buying was. Uh, but yeah, hindsight's a great thing. But yeah, it's a long game. And look, in, in, in um, you know, investing um, in the markets, you know, I've spoken to um, analysts there and they're like, it's a long game. There's a lot of interest in investing um, in the markets at the moment because the economy's been so crazy. But, <laughs> um, you know, the, the experts are like, you need to look at this as a long game. So if you see stuff going down, don't freak out. You know, stuff is going to go up. It's going to go down. You've got to look at you, you've got to look at your own timeline, your own yes. um, financial timeline. I think, as you said very astutely, property is not a quick win. Um, you hear stories about that, but that's that's yeah, the uh, that's exception. Just a media, that's a media catch. You know, that's, it's, uh, it's like that's a- the exception to the rule. And you know, I don't know. As, I, as I'm getting older and now, I have kids. Time time flies. You know, and so. What like ten years seems a really long time, but like you said, you know, you could buy something in ten years. You could have made, you know, it could be worth a lot more than what you pay for it, and you'll be like, I'm really glad I did that. But you're not going to get that win in two years. Yeah, yeah. that's right. You yeah. just got to wait it out. Which yeah, is fascinating. Set and forget. So, you set <laughs> and forget. That's right. <laughs> set and just you know check in occasionally. <laughs> so you you mentioned um, a little bit about mindset and psychology and so forth. I'd like to delve in a little bit, yeah. probably more like the resources side of things, because yeah. you're in the media quite a yeah. lot. You've mentioned Scott Papes, you know, Barefoot yeah. Investor book, yeah. which is a great resource. Have you got any other resources you could actually share with the listeners that might yeah. be able to also help them too? Well, again, like at Finder, we've just we've launched an app called the Finder app, uh, so it's easy to remember. Um, this is an app that's really taking advantage of um, some of the first early steps to open banking. So the Finder app um, is basically a portal that will allow you to access your savings accounts, um, your home loan, your superannuation, uh, credit cards, 
all in one place. So A, you can track everything in one place, which is so, like you've got no excuse really. You know, even I sometimes think, you know, in, in past times before I was using the app, oh, I have to go and, oh, what's my super account number? Oh, my private health insurance. You know, there's still sort of barriers to entry. I think the app and, and a lot of budgeting apps as well do this, but the Finder app to me is really interesting because it's actually bringing you all that information from elsewhere to one place. It's also going to identify and alert you when you've got a potential saving to be made. So, again, that really plays on. It's doing the hard work for you. So, when you think, oh, you know, I mean, I don't know, people are busy, we work all day, we might have kids or whatever, you get on the couch at 9 o'clock, you're not like, ooh, I'm going to no. check out my super. <laughs> Uh, you, you know, you're Sun's not going to do that. You're going to collapse in a heap, um, possibly with wine. So the app is like, the app's reminding you and it's actually giving you the pathway to do that. So I think apps like the Finder app, and there are other apps out there as well that allow you to budget and things. I think they make it, they, they almost, gaps in general almost gamify savings and investments. And I think particularly for all of us digital natives, that's really speaking to how we like to live our lives. You know, we all wear fitness trackers. You know, we like tracking everything now. We track everything. Um, so I think technology is a great way to do that. I also know, you know, our generations are a bit averse getting on the phone, for example. So, you know, there's so many um, institutions now. Look, look at neobanks and fintechs. You know, they're all based on messaging platforms. They're all living on an app in your phone. Um, I, I don't think our generations have that mindset where we need to go into a bank or we need to go into a new institution physically, which is pretty yeah. lucky right now. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, I've done work with, say, Athena Home Loans who are, you know, entirely um, app-based um, um, uh, you know, mortgage facility, lending facility, um, and and they're so agile because they're new. They don't have all that legacy um, software. They don't have branches. They don't need all the staff, so they can cut their overheads. And I think, I think you know, I would say to people looking into this, don't be afraid of those kind of new banks, those neo banks. They're they're backed by the same regulatory infrastructure as a big bank. Um, so be creative in that space too. Don't just bet, like rely on the big four. Um, you know, uh, look further afield. There's a lot of exciting things happening in finance at the moment. Yeah, I agree. And I, I'm aware of a few as well, like Yard yeah. Loans as well too. They're new up and coming yes. and they're, you know, they're also online as well. Yeah. And I know the, the CEO and the founders there as well. Yeah. Um, but what's really fascinating, yes, is that I guess it's just overcoming that difference of perception because yes. we've all been relying on the big four and yeah. you know, they're the secure banks and so yeah. forth. But new technology is allowing for things to one, be faster yeah. processing because that's yeah. been the biggest barrier for a lot of people. Yeah. Two, to get a better rate because yeah. they're saving costs instead of having to open all these these B branches and all that kind of yeah. stuff. And three, you know, it's sort of tapped into the younger generation because we're also used to technology. Yeah. I imagining, you know, if it was back in our parents' generation, they'd probably be walking into the bank, speaking with their bank manager and saying, hmm, can you please get us a loan? Yeah. <laughs> that and doesn't I mean, happen. No, and that's time consuming and it doesn't give you a full picture of the market either. That's where we are really blessed. Like you can get on a site like Finder and have a good look at what's out there. You can go on multiple sites and do that. Um, you can... Yeah, you can use an app. Like, there's really no excuse for us, you know, and we can do it anywhere. Like, that's the thing. We're not, you're not having to stump up and go into the city or do those things that our, our parents would have had to do. So, um, you know, there's a lot of ways to ensure you get a good deal. But I think the other thing that happens, and again, this is this kind of like behavior, is monitoring it. So, you know, we know like people have relationships that run shorter than the time they have with the same health insurer. I think like seven years, you know, people on these swaps, every seven years. People break up about every five years, which is kind of depressing. Um, you know, you should look at your, if you have private health, look at it every year, you know, like make those, um, use technology to remind you to do a check-in. Same with energy, like all this stuff. Yes, it can be a bit time consuming, but probably not as time consuming as you think. And as you pointed out, as we go forward and there's more technology on market and it really is starting to pick up pace, that it's, it, you know, we've got lenders that can issue home loans, you know, within, you know, yeah, 10, 15 days. minutes. Yeah, yeah 10 I mean, minutes. You, you know, you can yeah. set up a savings account. Um, you know, you can set it up to suit you to look the way you want it to look, um, you know, and we're always on our phones so that, you know, I would really encourage people to use apps. There's so many out there. Most of them are free. Finder app's free, um, you know, and, and they're really valuable. I think they're really valuable addition and can probably get some people over the line who may not have wanted to play in the space before. Most of them are super easy to use as well. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. Excellent. And probably one last question, yeah. I guess, Kate, wanted to ask you is, 
out of everything that you've done, how much yeah. of your success is due to your skill, intelligence and hard work and how much of it is because of luck? <laughs> Someone told me about getting into TV that, uh, and journalism that I'm, I was really lucky and I was like, yeah, right. I love that um, that saying. I don't know who I can who. It's a famous saying. It's like the harder you work, the luckier you get. <laughs> yep, very true. Hard work. Um, some things are luck, but I think for me, and I, you know, I was like I told in my my story to you earlier. I was very lazy <laughs> when I was younger. I've had to kick myself up the ass, and I've learned that you know you got to show up, uh, and you got to do the best job you can do. And you've also, and I still, you know, I'm still learning this, got to deal with failure. You know, I still, when I, something doesn't go my way, want to just get into bed and not get out. You know, you just got to keep on plugging away. And the, the glorious thing is then if things work, you know, you can go, yeah, that's on me, not because I was lucky. Women in particular often say, oh, I was really lucky. Um, you know, they often downplay their success too, I think. So, yeah, I'd say a lot of hard work, a few dashes of good luck there, um, big nod to my dad too for, you know, kicking me up the ass at the right time. Um, and you know, yeah, like fortunate to have a supportive family, but I think, you know, work hard and be consistent. Again, it's a long game. So, you know, I've had some weird career moves. I got sacked, you know, I dropped out of uni. It's about picking yourself up and trying again. It's a long game. And if, you know, I'd look back now, I go, oh, actually I've had a really interesting career so far and I've done a lot of interesting things. But, you know, I was also floating around when I was 20. Like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing <laughs> myself. So, you know, don't give up. Um, <laughs> keep, I love it. I love it. Yep. Keep pushing away. And with that's hindsight, great. you'll go, actually, that's not too bad. You know, yeah, you look back and done. you go, yeah, all right. I've done all right. You've done well, done well. Excellent. All right, Kate. Well, firstly, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast thank today. You. And thank you. And if people want to connect with you, find out more about what you're doing, you know, even reaching out to find her and getting more information, yeah. what's the best way to do it? Yeah, uh, I'm on LinkedIn, Kate Brown, Kate with a K, Brown with an E. Uh, I'm on Pocket Money Podcast, which is at Finder, which you can find on all the good places where your where, uh, your podcast is too, Tyrone. Um, Finder.com.au is our homepage. Finder app is our app. Um, I'm usually hanging around in all those spaces. Uh, and I'm on Twitter as well at Kate Brown 7 um, So I'm out there on the socials. Feel free to hit me up. Love to hear your stories. Lovely. Well, thank you so much again for your time today. It's been a thank pleasure you. to be able to have you on and uh, looking forward to hearing more further stories in the future. Yes. Thanks so much.